It's time to leave the endless monotony of Anglo-Saxon England behind and be transported into the golden age of Islam, an age rich with culture, art, philosophy, science and political intrigue. At the heart of it all lies the golden city of Baghdad, but it is on the outskirts of Baghdad in a little village called Amber, where your story starts. Swiftly awakened from a nightmare by your pal Nihal, you strap into the scrappy shoes of Basim. It is in these shoes that you will run through his origins from a lowly street thief into full-fledged master assassin, and inevitably, the Norse god Loki himself. What? Don't worry, we'll get there. Basim is driven by the ambition for something greater. But despite his dreams of a better life, he is still confined by the realities of his surroundings. He's poor. It sucks. And what does a poor thief do? He pickpockets. Pickpocketing is a simple mechanic. You walk up to a person whose pocket you want to pick, a pickpocketee if you will, and press the assigned button to begin. A yellow diamond will show up on the screen and another diamond will move into its radius, but only for a limited time. You need to press the button again when both diamonds are joined and if you manage that, the pickpocket is successful. If you don't, it fails. A simple and accessible mechanic. One that is easy to grasp and can be easily taught in the opening of the game, but one that also maintains variance from start to end. Every pickpocket is different. Depending on an array of factors, the inner diamond can be smaller or bigger, and the window of opportunity to join the diamonds can be longer or shorter. This makes each pickpocket hard to predict, and it is why it is repeatedly satisfying each time you pull it off. But the mechanic itself is not what makes it stand out. It's how its inclusion opens room for dynamic gameplay. If you fail a pickpocket, the pickpocketee will notice and they will call for the guards. The guards will quickly arrive to investigate the crime and if they discover you, they will try their hardest to take you down. So, what can you do? Well, you can hide, you can run away, you could stand your ground but that's awfully risky. The guards do pack a punch. Whatever you decide is a direct consequence of your mistake. In a game's world, the impact of your actions is vitally important. How NPCs react to you, how the AI controls the boundaries of gameplay, it makes your presence within it all the more immersive. When systems work in tandem with each other and not in conflict, it builds suspense for the possibilities of what can happen rather than anticipation for what you expect to happen. And this helps tremendously for the opening of Mirage, an old mechanic transformed into something new. And just like that, we're off to a great start. Big tick for Ubisoft, but come on, let's be a little bolder. Bassam's better than just a bit of pickpocketing. He wants to go for the big score. And what better way to prove himself than stealing from the Khalifa himself in the Winter Palace. After sneaking your way through, you find the Khalifa and his mysterious little box. Five masked figures soon enter the room and leave just as quickly. You don't care about them, you're just here for what's inside that box. That's a problem. You see, these guys, these mysterious masked men, are the primary antagonists of the game. But right now, you care more about what's inside the box. You don't know anything about these men. They don't interact with you and they don't impact you or your greater surroundings at all. You have no reason to care about them. A mystery without the intrigue. Unfortunately, these men will remain a mystery and an incredibly dull one at that. For now, it's time to steal the box from the boss. After making your way through the heavy resistance, you open the chest and inside lays a shard that displays a cryptic message. You attempt to decipher the message, but before you can make any sense of it, oh no, you've been caught. After a quick tussle, you try and get away until suddenly, a grave mistake. In your defense, Nihal stabs the Khalifa. Catastrophe. Disaster. Two lowly thieves now responsible for the death of the man who rules the entire Muslim world. Well, it's more Nihal's fault, isn't it? I mean, she's the one that stabbed him. She's the one that killed him. Not you. It's her fault. The leader of the entire Islamic population murdered in cold blood. Man, you almost wish that you killed the Khalifa yourself. At least then you'd have a reason to care about what happens next. The chase is on. 
with your pursuers in tow, the only thing that matters now is the swift getaway. Escape, a staple of the Assassin's Creed franchise. Hell, the first Assassin's Creed trailer made it its primary selling point. Get in, stab stab, get out. With the entire city tracking you down, the stalker in the shadows quickly became the prey. The only safe passage was up. Verticality was your advantage. Sure, soldiers could follow you, but they didn't have your speed, your smarts, your mastery of parkour. The rooftops were your domain, and they weren't invited. Leaping from building to building, swinging between beams and vaulting over terrain, all in quick succession. This world was your playground, beginning with your blade and ending in their confusion all with a little bit of acrobatic flair to flesh it out. This was the core of the assassin fantasy, and it was magnificent. But it has been missed. For some time now, the thrill of the chase has been fading. Pursuits that could stretch the entire expanse of a city have long since disappeared. The urgency for escape is gone, replaced by vast arenas filled with warriors that possess godlike superpowers. With such an emphasis on combat in these recent games, escape seems futile. An encounter ends when you put the other man in the ground. A foundation fit for a great many games. But does it fit Assassin's Creed? Mirage attempts to answer that question. So let's see what it says. Escape is a mechanic that is tough to convince players to engage with. Running away from an encounter clashes with our very instinct. Engaging in that encounter is usually more enjoyable. But what if it wasn't? What if the encounter was challenging? And what if, more importantly, it was so dull, so repetitive, so utterly lifeless that it made other solutions not only viable, preferable. That's where escape comes in. Escape initiates when you are detected. Detection is the result of making a mistake, and escape offers you a way out, literally, a solution to a problem. There are three stages of escape, discovery, pursuit, and evasion. When you are discovered, you have a small window to eliminate those who discovered you, or nullify the impact of your discovery by using tools or skills. If you aren't fast enough, the pursuit starts. This is the part where the score kicks in and everything ramps up to 11. Dashing through the city's web of bustling streets, you twist around the tight corners of its narrow alleyways and eventually make your ascent to the top of Baghdad's elevated labyrinth. It's here where the advantage falls in your favor and the expanse of your options grows limitless. Up, down, across, around. You can choose where to go and how you're getting there. Your pursuers may be a threat, but they are not in control. Once you've reached your route's end, it's time to evade. You can wait for the guards to give up, or you can use more effective strategies. Hiding spots, benches, bushes, or blending in with the crowd. Eventually, the hunted one becomes the hidden one, and the escape is complete. This is the assassin fantasy fulfilled. This is Assassin's Creed at its best. But this is also Assassin's Creed Mirage. And Mirage is far from its best. The problem with Escape in Mirage is that it has no depth. That's the simple truth. For Escape to feel meaningful, you must have pursuers. In Mirage, you just don't. If you're detected, make a quick trip to the rooftops and boom, it's over. You have the high ground. It's easy to underestimate the power of the AI to consistently disappoint and while it does try to surprise, it inevitably loses its footing and falls flat on its face. Granted, if you are detected, the guards will actively search for you as you trigger your escape, but they are far less likely to follow you, let alone chase you. This has considerable bearing on all other systems in the game. Having it be extremely simple to escape weakens the impact of making a mistake, particularly during stealth. If you're detected, just run up a building and wait. There might be a little more maneuvering here and there based on your circumstance, but that's about the extent of it. Guards never look up, so that's all you have to do. Stealth encounters can now be easily reset in a short amount of time, transforming escape into its worst possible form, a waste of time. 
Additionally, if you don't have anyone pursuing you, the challenge of combat is obsolete because it's so easily avoidable. But there is a balance to be struck, and it's all about efficiency. If an escape lasts too long or becomes too difficult, it changes into a mechanic that you would prefer to avoid. Escape doesn't progress your current encounter, it only delays it or resets it. That is its primary function. So, if it takes too long to do that, you're hit with a major setback. And that's the reason why they have made escape so simple in Mirage. Escape only exists to quickly correct your mistakes and return to the better mechanics in this game for as long as possible, like stealth. If that is its primary purpose, then that is as far as it can go. Any further and other mechanics would be sacrificed. And that is the balance. But what if that wasn't its primary purpose? What if its primary purpose was to be fun? Bordeaux gave us all the tools to make it fun. They just didn't let us do anything with them. Ubisoft need to go back to the drawing board and try again. Like Bassem. Leave now. Oof, that was rough, eh? After the murder of the Khalifa, Bassem finds refuge with the Hidden Ones, and after some more tutorials and a training montage, Bassem is welcomed into the fold, and bingo bango bongo, we're finally off to Big Bad Baghdad. In the heart of the unforgiving desert, Baghdad emerges as an enchanting oasis. At its gates, a sea of lush greenery unfolds before you, tropical trees flourishing both inside and outside the city. This vibrant sanctuary stands as a stark contrast to the arid, sun-baked landscape that surrounds it, a testament to nature's resilience. The citizens inside, donned in authentic 9th century robes and garments, paint a colourful tapestry of social activity. The streets come alive with the chatter and movements of its people. Market stalls beckon with their vibrant displays. Colourful fabrics drape over them, with markets displaying a diverse array of goods, from exotic spices to luxurious textiles and precious trinkets. Each stall tells a story of commerce and culture, bearing weight to Baghdad's historical significance. Deep rivers gracefully curve through the heart of the city. In the wealthy districts, the waters run crystal clear, mirroring the glory of the architecture. While in the poorer districts, the rivers turn dreary, their waters carrying the hues and fragrances of spices a reflection of the Harbia district's industrial character. Baghdad's architecture stands as a blend of elegance and simplicity, with iconic dome structures that harken back to another era. Rooftops are adorned with rugs and elegant carpets. It's on these elevated havens that citizens find respite from the relentless desert sun. So, that's how beautiful it is. Now let's talk about how useful it is. Baghdad's inner network of buildings and traversal systems is executed masterfully. Every single serving of its outstanding architecture is reachable, and they beautifully flow between one another seamlessly. The start of a parkour run can originate from anywhere in the city, and with how fast it is to ascend, why wouldn't you want to climb? It looks cool, and it feels cool. Graciously flowing from a slide to a zip to a swing is effortless, and more importantly, it's accessible. You can do it all the time, again and again and again. Buildings are tightly packed against one another, creating an endless series of roads above that trivialize the ones below. Baghdad's alleyways, markets, streets and courtyards are complex and chaotic. The heavy crowds that occupy them only get in the way. They don't slow you down, of course, but they don't help. It is only on the rooftops where you can fully express your freedom of movement. 
there is an abundance of tools to utilize in a free run. You could start with a ladder or a lift, quickly transition into a slide, and then turn the corner by using a winch to swing around. That might connect into a series of rods, beams and poles that you can mount and dismount at your discretion. For a longer gap, you might use a zip line to beam yourself across, or you might employ precision and delicately make your way over a tightrope, looking down on the stunning vastness of the streets beneath. The terrain you traverse is smooth. You don't get stuck and each piece effortlessly flows into the next. Movement is constant and it only stops the moment you pause to appreciate the city that supports it. You don't have to stick to the rooftops though. You could take to the ground and employ a sprint, but the change of speed from Basson's basic jog isn't very obvious. What is obvious is the speed you get from a jump from a climb, from a swing. So why run when you can fly? The buildings of Baghdad serve not only as the most enjoyable method of traversal in Mirage, but critically they are the most efficient. The rivers that flow in and out of Baghdad can be crossed with boats, but the boats never get you to where you need to go. For a tour of the city, they're excellent, but that is the extent of their function. What about mounts? They serve as the quickest method of movement outside of Baghdad but not within. They instantly slow to a crawl once you enter the city limits, and navigating your way through the city in the saddle is irritating. Choosing the rooftops over the camel is then an easy choice, and nothing can take away from the speed and thrill of Baghdad's rooftops. Hardly any building is insurmountable. No obstacle can't be crossed, and in turn, the sensation can't be matched. The city and level design of Mirage is one of its strongest qualities. Once again, the fantasy of the assassin, the blade in the sky, has been perfectly realized. They've nailed it. The design of Baghdad is mesmerizing. The presentation of parkour is excellent. But what is it like to play? How does parkour feel in Assassin's Creed Mirage? Simple. It feels fucking terrible. The easiest place to start is with the controls. Where Baghdad is your playground, the controls are your prison. You have one input when you engage in parkour. One. One button to jump, one to slide, one to swing, one to vault, and one to climb. Unless you want to go down, now we have two inputs. Wow. Not only is that undeniably restrictive, it's also a miracle when it works. When you assign an array of actions to one input, it's up to the game to determine what happens next. Maybe you wanted to jump. Maybe you wanted to climb. Maybe you just wanted to make a tiny adjustment. Too bad. The game doesn't care. The game is going to do exactly what makes sense in whatever context it finds itself in. And when that context is simply getting from A to B, the game does a fine enough job. Go forward, press a button, and the game will do the rest. You have the controller, but you have no control. A control scheme doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be simple either. What it does need to be is responsive. Responsive to your inputs, your planning, and your actions. You only need to look at the tool system in this game to understand what I'm talking about. More on that in a bit. Being able to manipulate the controls in a sequence and manner of your choosing allows for the freedom of self-expression, which is fundamental to the core foundations of parkour, which itself is core to the foundation of Assassin's Creed. Parkour was not just about side ejects, back ejects, and ledge grabs. It was about moving through the world in whatever way you wanted to. This way may not have been the most efficient. It may not have been the fastest. It usually wasn't, but it was your way. You were responsible for finding your path through the world of Assassin's Creed. And that responsibility was liberating. But now, all your control, all your expression, all your freedom has been stripped away. All for the sake of accessibility. But let's be clear. This isn't accessible. This is lazy. And like I said, this is only the start of the problems with parkour. As pretentious as it sounds, parkour needs to be handled with grace. The movements of an assassin need to be swift, 
and they need to feel intentional. Each jump carries your momentum forward, so each landing must bear the weight of that impact. It's only with an assassin's balance that you can easily flow into the next maneuver. And it's with this sequence of maneuvers that the glory of parkour can reach its ambitious heights. The animations. I'm talking about the animations, man. They suck. The problem with the parkour animations isn't that they look bad, some of them actually look great. It's that they feel bad. Swinging is a prime example. The start of a swing feels okay, but the landing always feels bad. The reason being, when Bassam lands, he is pulled toward the next platform rather than allowing his momentum to carry himself forward. Each piece of terrain feels like a magnet that forcefully drags Bassam to it. Bassam's momentum doesn't flow, it stops, and then starts, and then stops. You're not moving through the terrain, you're being pulled through it. Let's take the winch for example. You jump, Bassam grabs the winch, and you swing around the corner and make your landing. 99% of the time, it works every time. It looks good, and it feels good. And there's a simple reason for that. Context. You can only approach a winch from one direction. The speed in which you approach it is consistent, and it swings you around in only one direction. It's then easy to illustrate its momentum because it's consistent every time. There are no other variables. You can't drop onto it from above, and you can't hang onto it from below. You can't even change the direction it takes you. The context is the same every time. It's predictable, both in its function and its presentation. It's fun, but it's shallow. You could even say it's scripted like vaulting, or sliding, or zip lines. They all feel good because they're scripted. You approach from one direction, you are taken in one direction, forward. But what if you try to change the context? What if you try to hang on a zip line? You can't. What if you try and climb instead of vault? You can't. And how does it make sense that you begin a slide from a standstill? It doesn't. When you introduce context into Mirage's movement, it begins to show its ugly face. And that's why Bordeaux tried to remove as much context as possible. Most of the time, you traverse the rooftops in a straight line. You might start with a slide, then run up a ramp, then a quick zip line descent into a cool pole vault, then a nice jump through a window, but if you go slightly offline, it doesn't feel too good, does it? The city is designed to be traversed in a straight line. That's why all the terrain is so closely packed together. So, when your parkour inevitably fails, it doesn't feel that bad. You know what does feel bad? Crossing rivers. If you're on the more elevated side of the river, it's usually a quick jump or zip over. But when you're not, when you're on the lower side of the river, you have to find the most efficient way across. You could swim, of course, but diving in, swimming for a second or two, and then climbing up feels, well, shit. You could jump across the platforms, but you have to trust the game to believe that's what you wanted to do. It's the same button to jump as it is to dive, of course. You could use a boat. Just kidding. Or you could take the fun approach. Just find some elevation and leap over. But that isn't always consistent, and it's never the most efficient. This is what happens when you add context to Mirage's broken parkour system. This is what happens when you provide a variety of solutions to its problems. It becomes more confused and even more restrictive. But parkour isn't just broken, it's boring. And above all, it was supposed to be better. That's what they promised. Should I be surprised those promises were empty? No. Can I still be disappointed? Of course I can. Parkour isn't just a gimmick. It's the way in which we explore the world of Assassin's Creed. It is core to the fantasy and the fun. In a franchise full of half-hearted mechanics, parkour was the one that made it stand out. But Mirage hides it. Hides it under restrictive controls. Controls that commit the cardinal sin 
taking the foundation of Assassin's Creed and reducing it down to a state of autopilot. There is no level of creative expression when it comes to parkour because there is ultimately no skill ceiling. Once you've reached a rooftop in Baghdad, congratulations, that's the skill ceiling. That is the peak of Mirage parkour. When we lose our agency, our control, our freedom of movement, what happens? Very quickly, it becomes repetitive. It becomes boring. And what do we fall back to when a traversal system is boring? Fast travel. The one feature that has been in every Assassin's Creed game. Their function has shifted here and there, but here, it's simple. Once you get to the top and you do a little spin, that landmark is now unlocked as a fast travel station. At any point during the game, you can open up the map, make your way over to the eagle icon, and poof, you've reached your destination with the click of a button. Fast travel is a strong and easy solution to long, drawn out stretches of travel that don't add anything to the progression or the plot. It quickens the pacing of a game and turns traversal from a waste of time into a simple way to advance the gameplay. With such an expansive world, it's easy to get lost in the depths of Mirage's story. And so, fast travel is there to connect the wayward pieces of its scattered narrative. It's hard to forget what happened before when you can so quickly see what happens next. But when what happens next isn't very interesting... Let me guess. The Order. It's only a matter of time before the dark truth of fast travel is forced back into the light. Fast travel is only here to make the gameplay more accessible. Looks like we got a theme emerging here, fellas. Moving through Baghdad requires input. Very little input, as we've discovered, but it does require it. And unfortunately, you're going to move a lot in Mirage. A whole lot. So how do you speed up the pace of movement? Well, you could just speed it up. But that takes effort. That takes time. And developers don't have time. And that's why you get fast travel. It's quick. It works and it never needs to be updated or improved upon because it's a perfect mechanic. It's instant. It does what it needs to and it does it well every time. It never presents a problem, so why not include it? The answer is staring you right in the face because it hurts every other mechanic in the game. Parkour may have its flaws, but fast travel makes it pointless. With the power of the SSD, we can cross an entire city Hell, an entire map in mere seconds. A magnificent mechanic, buried alive under the weight of a really fucking stupid one. Fast travel betrays the world it's founded upon, all for the ease of access. The beauty of Baghdad, replaced by a dark, ugly loading screen. But among all the other problems in this game, it isn't really criticized, because it's a choice. A choice you don't have to make. I know I didn't. I also chose my own control scheme. I also chose to play on hard. All of these decisions enhanced my experience, and so I tolerated the fact that I had to make them. And so we tolerate, and we keep on tolerating. Because we believe, if we tolerate enough, if we just stay patient, we might just find a good game after all. And so we continue to scale those viewpoints, not because we need to or really even want to, but because that's the Assassin's Creed thing to do. Get your wand and trolley ready. The nostalgia train is back on track. The Assassin Bureau. A reminder of the simpler times. A time when the Middle East was centre stage, the targets were lifeless and the voice acting even more so. All this time, I never told you I was sorry. Too damn proud. You lost your arm because of me. Chuck that blue filter on and it's just like the good old days. Here, in the land of God, was your mission. 
Well, lucky for us, those days are back. Call me Eric Clapton because I'm about to cream all over the place. The Assassin Bureau is here for three reasons. To upgrade and unlock your tools, to receive new Assassin contracts, or to advance the story. So what are we here for? The story. Oh, don't worry. We'll be back very soon. Upon reaching Baghdad, the story branches out, allowing you to tackle each mission in whatever order you wish. Freedom? Excuse me? Each mission begins with an investigation that takes you to one guard outpost, to another guard outpost, to, you guessed it, another guard outpost. And each of those investigations end with you making your way through an even bigger guard outpost to finally assassinate the big bad boss. So how do you make your way through all these guard outposts? Well, with your tools of course. See, I told you we'd be back. But I can't talk about the tools unless I talk about the stealth. So, here we are, finally, the core of Assassin's Creed Mirage, arguably the primary reason for its existence in the first place, stealth. A feature that hasn't only been dismissed in the recent entries, but openly mocked, disregarded, gutted, utterly butchered. And yet, here we are. The wait is finally over. They promised a return to bring back what once was the foundation of Assassin's Creed and make it great again. So, did they pull it off? The answer is unequivocally yes. Stealth is back, motherfuckers. It's funny how one simple change can either destroy a mechanic or deliver it back to greatness. One hit kills. Every single enemy in this game goes down to one simple stab to the chest, to the throat, the spine or wherever else makes sense. Every single enemy. Except for one. But hey, we're being positive here. Let's keep it that way. It's hard to illustrate just how good stealth is in Assassin's Creed Mirage. Sneaking around for minutes on end can look boring, but it's not. It's great, because it feels great. And feelings are hard to put into words, but I'm gonna try anyway, so let's see how I go. The best thing about stealth is its difficulty. I don't mean in Mirage, I mean in general. Stealth is fun because it requires you to use your brain. Combat is reactionary. They do something, you do something. They swing, you block. That's why Souls Likes are so popular, because their combat requires you to think ahead. And when you think harder than the AI does, that feels good. That is your big brain moment. In Mirage, stealth is split into two categories, melee and ranged. Pretty standard stuff. Let's start with melee. In melee, you have one weapon. On the surface, that may seem restrictive, but for an Assassin's Creed fan, the hidden blade is all we need. It's the only thing we need. And if you change it... I will massacre you! I will fuck you up! With it comes an array of animations, and they feel spectacular. It doesn't matter what context it's in, Deleting a group of guards from stealth will always feel amazing. What's more amazing is the variety of ways you can pull it off. You could end them from above. You could end them from below. You could end them from a stop. You could end them from a go. Mirage doesn't hold back, 
so you shouldn't either. The hardest part about melee stealth is getting in close for the kill. The closer you get, the higher the risk of detection. In Valhalla, that risk was constant, and you didn't even have to get close. But no longer. Detection in Mirage works. Very rare is there an occasion where a detection feels unfair, and rarer still that that unfair detection can't be corrected. Your mistakes still have consequences, but here they are always your mistakes. A kill feels calculated, and a kill feels earned, and it only gets better from here. If there's someone near your first kill, you can chain that into your second kill with a quick input. If they're close, it's a swift stab. And if they're further, a throwing knife will do the trick. This doesn't just add some visual pizzazz, it adds some mechanical pizzazz. If you can chain one kill into two, that allows for deeper preparation at the start of an encounter. A nearby guard who would have detected you can now be dealt with before they even notice you. And so, the intelligence of stealth is met with the intensity of speed. And speed is important for Mirage's stealth. You can't go from blitzing through a city to blending with a bush. Not for very long at least. It's the speed that makes stealth so good. Sure, the crouch makes you slower, but not by much. And critically, you can still accelerate while crouched. This means you can make decisions on the fly. Ascend to get a higher angle. Adapt in the face of a wayward patrol. Advance on an open opportunity. The speed of stealth is its greatest quality. That is, until you take everything else into account. Ranged. With a little bit of aiming, it's time to get maiming. Throwing knives, smoke bombs, blow darts, noisemakers and traps. All contextual tools that in unison really make you feel like an assassin. Let's talk about the throwing knife. One shot to the head, dead and dusted. These are, without a doubt, the most overpowered tools in the entire game. But we don't play Assassin's Creed for balance, we play it for fun. And my god, these are fun. With the right upgrades, you can throw these from anywhere and hit anyone. The challenge is making sure you hit them in the right spot right between the eyes. If you don't, the kill is never guaranteed. And so we introduce some skill into stealth. Not much Fuck. at all, but some. Fuck. Fuck. The throwing knives, like all other tools in this game, are a consumable. Early game, this presents a problem. Their scarcity is significant. If you run out, you're forced into melee. So their usage needs to be carefully considered. Target neutralized. You need to prioritize your targets properly. A miss is costly, so practice is essential. And once you get to late game, your practice is rewarded. You learn quickly that throwing knives can be easily restocked. And alongside some certain upgrades, you will never run out again. The rarity of throwing knives, replaced by the push for accessibility. But here, it doesn't matter. Why? Throwing knives aren't great because of how they work, they're great because of how they feel. And they feel fantastic. Like smoke bombs. If you've got your head screwed on straight, the smoke bomb will become the first optional tool you will unlock. Their usage is simple. When you deploy them, either from afar or close, they explode and release a cloud. Every enemy caught within that cloud is stunned, leaving them vulnerable for a quick takedown. The best thing about the smoke bomb, though, is that you can use it in every scenario in the game. You can use it to close the gap and take down a group in quick succession. You can use it as a getaway from a sticky situation. You can even use it to block line of sight. And because it detonates upon collision with the ground, aim isn't important. It has a wide radius when it explodes, and the duration of the effect, even without upgrades, is very forgiving. You can use it preemptively during stealth. You can use it as a reaction upon detection, or you can use it as an end to combat. That might seem incredibly unbalanced, and it is, but it's fun. So who cares? Assassin's Creed never relied on balance to be fun. It relied on fun mechanics. And we've got one. We've also got the Noisemaker, the Blow Dart, and the Trap, which make up the rest of our tools. 
All three of these are a little more circumstantial and a little less versatile. They are also primarily used in a stealth state. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use them though. Some of my favorite moments came from using them. Unlocking these tools was one of my highest priorities, and I'm glad I did. Their usage varies vastly, and other abilities are objectively better, but they're nowhere near as fun. And this is what they got right. Assassin's Creed Mirage doesn't have very deep stealth, doesn't even scratch the surface. It's hovering above the surface, but it's fun. It's here, and I'm happy. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't point out the pros and the cons. So let's get mad for a second. Stealth may be fun, but that doesn't mean it isn't broken. Yeah, it's time to talk about controls again. The same button to assassinate is the same button to attack. This isn't special for an Assassin's Creed game. The difference here is the context. Yep, that big old buzzword again. When you're crouched, you would assume that when you go to kill someone, Basim would use a hidden blade. And you'd be right, that's exactly what he does. Unless you're in cover. Why? I have no idea. Sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he snaps to cover, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes it takes one whistle to bring a guard over, sometimes 20. Sometimes you can chain assassinations, sometimes you can't. Sometimes the animations are quick, and sometimes they're slow. You get it. My point is this. The stealth is very inconsistent. In an already shallow system, this is annoying. What's unforgivable though, is just how shallow it really is. Entering stealth for the first time is the same as entering stealth for the 10th time, the 50th time, the 500th time. It's the same every time. You might approach from a different direction and in a different spot, use different tools, but all in all, it's the same every time. You scout, you sneak, you slice. Getting detected changes things, absolutely but stealth ends when you're detected. We've already explored how bad escape is in Mirage. So how do you make stealth deeper? They already gave us the tools. They just didn't let us do anything with them. I want you to have a look at this. Looks terrible, right? No assassin in their right mind would wear that. That's the point. This is a disguise. There is a grand total of who disguises in the entirety of Assassin's Creed Mirage? Two. And they are usable in two scenarios. Outside of those scenarios, they're useless. But you know what they do? They fundamentally change the way you approach stealth. Social stealth is used to hide in a crowd as you make your way toward a target. But what if you didn't have to hide in the crowd? What if you were the crowd? That takes social stealth, a system that has been here from day one, a system that has never been improved, never really been effective, into a system that can dramatically change the entire foundation of stealth. You wouldn't have to kill everyone anymore. You could if you wanted to, but you wouldn't have to. An assassin has one target in mind. So why not give us more ways to take them out? Ubisoft Bordeaux did just that. The hell are you supposed to be? I'm vengeance. But they only did it twice. We need stealth to evolve, to go deeper. We need stealth where we can plan ahead, but not predict the outcome. But we haven't had stealth for a long time. So for now, Having it at all is enough. I guess I should probably talk about the combat now, huh? Ugh, do I have to? Fine. Parry, dodge, hit. Hold button longer, bigger hit. Damage sponge is gone, counter kills back. But cool animations alone don't make for good gameplay. And that is that. So there. I took the same amount of time to talk about it as they did to develop it. 
let's move on. For what it's worth, the return of stealth is awesome. So awesome, in fact, it makes every other mechanic in this game look worse, like the combat. We all know the combat is terrible. In every respect, it's one of the game's biggest flaws, and that's intentional. By it being so fucking bad, it makes the stealth that much better. But the combat isn't the game's biggest flaw. Oh no, it doesn't even come close. The worst part about this game has been obvious from the very start. It's clear as day. You see, the worst part about this game isn't the combat. It isn't the parkour. Hell, it isn't even the brain-dead mission structure or the dialogue that makes your ears bleed. It's far simpler than all of that. It's Bassam. It's unfortunate, but it's true. A character doomed from the very start, and the only protagonist in the entire franchise whose story was already told. How do you develop a character when you already know what they become? It's not impossible. It's been done before. It's still being done now all the time. But it has been done so, so much better than this. You see, Bassam isn't a boring character. He's not even an annoying character. He's actually a very interesting and compelling character in Valhalla. But this is a mirage. And that's exactly what Bassam is. A mirage. You think I was going to make this video this long and not make that joke? Come on, you should have expected better. I definitely did. With Bassam, I mean. Bassam is a character you do not care about. You have no reason to. He has no family, no friends, and no purpose. But above all, he has no character. Bassam can't be defined by any one trait, because he has no traits. He isn't stoic, he isn't charismatic, he isn't stylish, he isn't wise, he isn't fearless, he isn't entertaining, he isn't inquisitive, he isn't witty, he isn't committed, he isn't compelling, he isn't likeable, he isn't a good character. Because he isn't allowed to be. This game was made to explore his origins. We spend about a tenth of the game doing that. The rest is frankly just bullshit until we find out how he becomes Loki. We'll get there, I promise. Mirage gives Bassam no time to develop as a character. But Mirage was made to develop Bassam. I just... I don't, I don't know. Okay, let's explore this a bit. <gasps> Bassam is a thief. That is the only life he knows. He would have to live on the street, but stealing keeps him off it. Okay, we're getting somewhere. But he's also noble, not just stealing for himself, but for others, including a young protege that he guides and cares for. That's what I'm talking about. But he's also ambitious. Keep it going. He wants a better life. Can relate. And he sees an opportunity with the hidden ones. Could it get any better? He goes to prove his worth by stealing from the Khalifa himself. It just did. But it goes horribly wrong. The Khalifa is killed. So he has to escape. And luckily, He's rescued, but not before his protege is killed. He then begins his journey to clear his name and take revenge on the men who butchered his people. That's what you assume anyway. That's the painfully obvious path they could have taken. It's basically the same as one and two I'll kill you for what you've done. and three. <laughs> and brotherhood and unity and origins. But what if Ubisoft decided to be creative and get you to kill these five random guys instead because they told you to? That would be compelling, wouldn't it? Turns out, it wasn't. And the story is thrown out the window, and with it, all of Bassam's character development. We can't empathise with Bassam because he has no identity. That's okay if he was trying to find it, but he isn't not until the very end of the game. Why then? It's not like there wasn't any other opportunities beforehand. He starts as a thief and then becomes an assassin. We can see that change, but we can't feel it. He's not attached to the assassins and he's not connected to the creed. He has no underlying motivation to join the assassins. He just does, cause he thinks they're cool. But assassins aren't just cool, they are defined by their principles. Principles Bassam doesn't seem to share. For example, his protege Jasib 
is killed and hung for all to see during the prologue. He is so heartbroken by this, he vows to never see Nihal again. It was her fault after all. But only mere hours later, he sees a man tortured to death right in front of him, only to dismiss it completely. Do the ends justify the means? It could if Bassam cared about the end, but there's no indication that he does. So, if Bassam doesn't care, then we don't care. We don't care about Bassam. We don't care about his journey. We just don't care. A promising game, let down by a terrible protagonist. But a weak protagonist alone doesn't doom a story. It can still be saved by the supporting cast, or a strong antagonist, or a fascinating narrative. Yeah, nah, this story is fucked. Let's continue where we left off. So, like I said, once you get to Baghdad, the story branches off. Each district has a standalone story, and each one culminates with you unmasking one of the five members of the Order of the Ancients, who you then go on to assassinate in their respective black box mission. The standalone mission structure is used to encourage freedom for your approach, as each district story can be tackled in any order. Each one adds a piece to the overarching puzzle, as you uncover the identity of the leader of the order. I won't go too in depth here, because there really isn't any depth to begin with. What I want to focus on though is the order, the structure of the story. To do that, we need to have a look back at Origins. Bash it for its bloat all you want, but Origins got at least one thing right, making an intriguing mystery. The identities of those behind the masks was something you desperately wanted to uncover. Not because you were told to, not because you would get some meaningless reward at the end, but because you cared. Because Bayek cared. Sleep. I never sleep. I just wait in the shadows and I will kill you all. Everyone who sniffed the air that day in Siwa! Bayek craved answers. He craved revenge and he wouldn't stop until he got it. The mask was a question and taking it off was the answer. Who did this? Why did they do this? And how is this all connected? The order worked not because of who they were, but because of what they represented. In Mirage, the order can work, but only when it's structured around the game's story and not its gameplay. They either need to make you care about the mask and what it represents, or the face underneath. Mirage doesn't allow for either. Investigation is a gimmick. And by the time you unveil the identity of the Order's leader, you forget everything it took to get there. You forget about the world of Assassin's Creed Mirage. And that is its biggest tragedy. Because the world is fucking mesmerizing. The golden age of Islam. The golden city of Baghdad. But as soon as the credits roll, it's all forgotten. Ready for a quick history lesson? Don't care, you're getting one anyway. 861 AD to 870 AD, a time of massive political upheaval where leaders were getting killed and deposed left and right, including this guy. It was fucking Game of Thrones out here. And it has since become known as the Anarchy at Samara. And that is when Mirage is set. Can you tell? Are there any indicators at all that that period of intense chaos and instability is the one you're playing in? Nope. The major players are all here, but they have nothing to do. And because of the structure of the investigation missions, they are given no time at all to develop. Wasif, Ali ibn Muhammad, al mutawakkil al-Allah, all central people of this period, all sidelined, for no reason. I'm not saying that Assassin's Creed needs to highlight its history to be worthwhile. All I'm saying is that it needs to respect it. If it can't do that, it at least needs to make a story that highlights its world. Brendan Angelidis tried his hardest to rectify those mistakes, but a banging soundtrack can only go so far when it doesn't have the story to match. But here's the thing, Assassin's Creed Mirage doesn't just rely on its story to deliver its historical foundations, it relies on its world, 
and there is significant attention applied to the world's presentation. And if you're willing to look, there's several historical sites that you can visit in-game that offer meaningful insight into that world. These come in the form of codex entries that give you a very brief but appreciated summary of various elements of the period and the place that you spend all your time exploring. If only they weren't stuck behind disgusting menus and instead stuck behind the disgusting character models. At least then they would have been memorable. Like the side content. It's actually not bad. Assassin's contracts are back, baby. And they are, honestly, the best content in the game. I'm not joking. They're like really good. There's variety, both visually and mechanically. They're open, allowing freedom of approach, although limited still. There's plenty of them, and they mark the return of optional objectives. Now, optional objectives are a polarizing topic of discussion in this community. On the one hand, they're annoying, because they present a fail state that wasn't there before. Although the objectives are optional, the feeling after failure frustration isn't. It serves as a stark reminder of just how shit you really are. But on the other hand, optional objectives offer an alternative way to finish your mission. And although it's still not dynamic, it is different. And different is refreshing. That is, of course, until you stumble upon the return of a not-so-welcome feature. Tailing missions. Ubisoft! What was the reason? What was the reason? I just explained explain the reason. What was the reason, bitch? I don't need to explain myself to you. And what was have... the reason? Why? 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 Tailing missions are universally hated. And despite all this rage for 15 years, they are still here. Why? 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 Yeah. Tailing missions were good for one thing. They allowed a character to vomit out exposition and the player would tail them to absorb more context for the story. That's it. Enough with your in and prattle. In every other regard, they obliterated the gameplay. They brought the pace to a screeching halt. They are the most restrictive mechanic in the game. And above all, they're just so fucking Boring, man. But in Mirage, they're even worse. You don't get any exposition. You don't get a timer when you lose line of sight. And in some missions, you can't be detected. Why? It's a goddamn enigma. And enigmas are basically treasure maps that, upon collection, can lead you to various cosmetic rewards scattered throughout the map. They're made obsolete by Google, but it's good to know development time went somewhere. When you're exploring, you will also stumble upon a number of chests. Each chest holds upgrades for your weapons and armor. To access these chests, you must first complete a series of puzzles, because if you don't, this game would take only five hours to finish. You are also given a few side stories that get you drunk, wet, high, confused, and beat up with it all ending in a graveyard. Sounds like a typical Friday night. And then we have two collectible missions. Der Wish's Artifacts, which require you to complete a vast array of pickpockets all over the map. And then the Mysterious Shards, which require you to complete a vast array of pickpockets all over the map. Or you can just kill them. Upon completion, you get this outfit and this outfit, which can do this. And that is the side content. For what it's worth, the side content earns its place and provides sufficient enough value for all the completionists among us. For the first time in a long time, the side content is not the focus and it is not the priority. And that is perfectly fine. Addition by subtraction. But there is one addition that I have not brought up yet. An addition that marks the return of the last pillar of the franchise. The notoriety system. Action and consequence. Cause and effect. Dynamism. That's what the notoriety system is. A reaction to the choices you make. Baghdad is a big city and there are eyes everywhere. Stay your blade from the flesh of the innocent and stay your hand from their pocket. Not everything is permitted and within the confines of those guidelines, Assassin's Creed Mirage finds its footing. 
There are three levels of notoriety. Level one, level two, and level three. Level one is simple. Kill a few people, pick a few pockets, and the guards will be far more suspicious. But it's level two and level three where things get interesting. Let's start with level two. As you get increasingly careless with your violence, your infamy will raise, and as a result, the city guard will employ more ambitious tactics to stop you. The rooftops, which once were your sanctuary, are now your cage. Archers make their way up high to force you back down low. Nowhere is safe in the city, and with faster detection now more likely, you only have a short amount of time to soften your spotlight before you are finally found by the one champion who can stop you. The only one who can even hope to best you. The only one with your skills. The only one not afraid of the shadows. They will stop at nothing to find you. A one-on-one -on -one duel to the death is the only way out for either of you. It is time for level three. It is time to prove your worth against the one, the only, Shakira. Shakira is introduced at notoriety level three and will stop at nothing to track you down and end you. Whether you're deep in the heart of an enemy compound or wandering through the streets, Shakira will be there at every step of the way. Shakira is the only enemy in the game that cannot be stopped by stealth, and so the only way to win, the only way to rid yourself of the notoriety you've piled up, is in open combat. This turns combat from an absolute shit show into a little less shit, as Shakira hits you with a flurry of quick moves that test your reactions and resilience. Victory against Shakira is not guaranteed. Death will come, and Mirage is based on autosave features. So, if Shakira kills you, the shame of that defeat isn't washed away by a loading screen. You're still notorious after you load back up, so you must rise to the challenge. Unsheath your blade, spam the dodge button, and finally defeat the mighty Shakira. Or you could just pay this dude. With the click of a button, your notoriety ceases to exist. It's like nothing ever happened. All three levels of notoriety gone in the blink of an eye with a swift nod and a handshake. This isn't free though. A new currency system is here. Tokens, and it's with these tokens that you can pay off Munadis to lower your notoriety, pay cartographers for city maps, pay merchants to create distractions, or even pay soldiers to create distractions. But these tokens are easily attainable, and so notoriety, like a lot of other systems in this game, is abandoned. Its potential will never see the light of day, all for the sake of accessibility. Yep, we're back there again. Trust me, I hate this as much as you do. There are three levels of notoriety and three ways to get rid of it. There's paying the Minardis, besting Shakira, and ripping down wanted posters. The Munadi and Shakira remove all your notoriety and the wanted posters remove one level at a time. And that's to maintain balance because wanted posters are all over the place. It would trivialize notoriety if they did any more. But this isn't balanced. The token system is a decent idea, rewarding your exploration of the world by removing the obstacles in your way when you move through it. But it's half baked. Tokens are easy to come by. With Shakira on your ass, it's easy to just press a button to get her off you. But why would you? It's Shakira. She's the best part. We don't want tokens. We want Shakira. 
We want a system that can grow upon itself, a system that is a direct representation of your actions, a system that is a direct representation of the world's reactions, a system that adds dynamic context to all other aspects of the gameplay. And we almost had it. Shakira represents what this system could have been, a challenge where the outcome was never guaranteed, the world watching your every move and one that could match your every move. We need Shakira. We want Shakira. We don't want Kabiha. <sighs> Kabiha is the leader of the Order of the Ancients, and she is its only member that you don't get to take down yourself. And that is frustrating. Not just for you, but for Basim. It's also the only instance of Basim showing any uncertainty of his place within the world. It's here. Finally, that Basim is allowed to develop. It's here that we're finally allowed to care, but our story is almost ending. So it's too little, too late. Before the antagonist draws their final breath, they reveal a hidden truth. Upon learning this, you begin your journey back to where it all began, and it is here where all the major mysteries are revealed, and your mentor becomes your enemy. This is just theft at this point. And so, after it all, after the stealth, the parkour, the combat, the order, the beautiful city of Baghdad, it is here. It is time to tackle this absolute batshit crazy catastrophe of an ending. Here we go. During the duration of the game, Basim is haunted by nightmares. Nightmares that come to him in his sleep or when he kills people, but only these specific people. Why? Because fuck them, that's why. In these nightmares, he's met by a jinni, a terrifying creature that only gets closer to Basim every time he wakes. Clueless as to the jinni's origins, Basim journeys to Alamut for answers, but to also find meaning behind Kabiha's final words. What am I? Something more than man. It would be behind these doors that the puzzle would be solved. Alongside his dear friend Nihal, he makes his way through, and at the end of this long path, he discovers what's waiting for him. He discovers... Nihal? No, he discovers himself. Nihal isn't real. The Ginny isn't real. And with that discovery, Basim embraces his fear, his uncertainty, and becomes who he was truly meant to be. Loki. Meaning... Okay. This will take some explaining. So let's start with Nihal. Nihal isn't a real person. Nihal is you. You know how Nihal set the entire story in motion by killing the Khalifa at the start of the story? And you didn't feel too bad about it because it wasn't you who did it? Well, it was you. How about that? This entire time, Nihal was only a reflection of you, the side that you resisted, the side of you that was decisive, curious, ambitious, independent, and above all, interesting. The side of you that we couldn't see until the very end. Ugh. Now, let's talk about the Ginny. The Ginny represents your torment, your hardship, your fear, your pain, and it's only in this moment that you're able to conquer it and finally become whole, finally become Basim. But you're not Basim, you're Loki, sort of. Ugh. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No, it's just dumb. Before Mirage, there was Valhalla. Valhalla was about Vikings and Vikings love their gods. But in Assassin's Creed, these aren't your typical gods. They are what's known as Isu, a race of hyper-advanced beings. They are those who came before, the first civilization. All the mythologies described throughout the world are then retellings of their stories. Although inaccurate because, you know, myths aren't true. If we then observe our version of Norse mythology, we can conclude that Loki is not a big fan of Odin. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, we learn that that is also the case. Loki is tortured for poisoning Odin's son, Balder. What we also learn is that in Valhalla, Loki has been hiding in the real world in disguise. His disguise is Basim. 
Now, Basim is still Basim. He doesn't have Loki's consciousness, but rather he is an entity that stores Loki's memories, emotions, motivations, and ideas. He's here, but he's not here. He's here, but he's not here. He's, what do you mean? Uh, it's complicated. Hey, it's complicated, it right? Is. It's complicated. When Basim embraces the Jinni and Nahal in Mirage, which is told before Valhalla, he's embracing Loki's fear, his torment, but also his ambition and cunning. And so Loki's identity is released back into the physical world with Basim serving as his physical manifestation. Here's the thing though, I have no fucking idea if any of that is actually true. I'm fairly sure the general gist is there, but even after all this time, all the research I had to do, I'm still not sure whether my conclusion is correct. If this was the end of the franchise, that'd be fine, but it's not. This could have been a good twist, but it's not. Nihal rips away all of the compelling features that make Basim who he is, all for this stupid twist. Nihal, the Jinni, Loki, Basim, they are all so strongly separated from the greater world of Mirage that it destroys the world of Mirage. This story has nothing to do with the game you've been playing. But this story could have been great. If only they didn't wait until the end to tell it. It's been a question for some time now on if Ubisoft have the tools left to tell a compelling story. But now it's a question if Ubisoft have the tools to tell a coherent one. I've talked at length about the vast amount of features that exist within this game. Some of them are incredible and some of them not so much but they all share one similarity, one commonality that binds them all together. We have seen them all before. There's a lot of good in Assassin's Creed Mirage, but there is nothing new. Mirage is overflowing with potential, but it's starved of any meaningful execution. Its story is needlessly confusing. It's inconclusive and it lacks any direction either for itself or for the future of the franchise. Its structure is scattered. Its characters aren't given the attention they deserve. But the bones are here. The bones of Assassin's Creed is still here, somewhere. It's just been buried under the weight of its failings, under the weight of the question it compels us to ask. What is Assassin's Creed Mirage? Is it a return to the roots or is it just stubborn? staying put in the expansive shadow of its predecessors, afraid to venture out in order to find itself. Mirage is a game between two games, a game that doesn't care about its central character, a game that pushed its world to the shadows, a game that tries so hard to be something new, but is too afraid to separate itself from what came before. Ultimately, Mirage is a game that fails to recognize the reality of what it is, a game that despite all its flaws, was originally DLC. Can't reach its potential because it's held back by its problems. Problems it inherited from games that came before and problems that Ubisoft Bordeaux didn't have the time or the manpower to address. And it's hard to fault them for that. How do you top the spectacle of the mighty Vikings or the beauty of Paris? You don't, you can't, not unless you try something different. And that's where you can fault them because there is nothing new. There is nothing that surprised me. There's nothing that excited me. And so for me, and perhaps others, this game will inevitably become forgettable and its world with it. And that's the tragedy because I love this world. It's incredible. It's one of the best we've ever had and I've adored everyone. And despite what I've said, I really did like this game. The stealth, the parkour, those fucking rivers, man. None of it was perfect, mind you, but it did the job. I enjoyed my time with Assassin's Creed Mirage, but because of those problems, those mistakes, that unmet potential, I have no reason to ever play it again. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, seriously, thank you. This video transformed from an intriguing idea into a bit of a passion project such as the case with Assassin's Creed sometimes, but I thoroughly enjoyed producing it as it totally changed the way I approach pre-production, which is still a massive work in progress. So any feedback at all is welcome. I initially saw this as a proof of concept for myself as it compelled a great amount of effort and time from me at every stage of production to make it the best it can be. But there's always room for improvement. So any feedback you have, 
I will be eternally grateful for. This also marks the start of a new direction for the channel going forward with a bunch more critiques on the way and even a few video essays to keep it fresh and fun. So be sure to be on the lookout for those. I loved every moment of making this. So if you are here, again, thank you. But I can't drag this out for too long. So that's it from me. Peace. Peace.